This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. This Sunday, as with every Lord's Day, there'll be a group of people meeting together in this building to worship the God of the universe. And you know, there are few things as uplifting to a child of God as a properly executed worship service. The worship of God edifies us, it brings us joy, it strengthens and encourages us. Oftentimes I've heard Christians say after a worship service that before they arrived they were tired and thought about not coming, but that afterward they were so glad they did that it refreshed them in a way that they really needed. You know, it's good for us to be together with those who also want to worship God. Worship services is kind of like a haven. It's kind of a clinic. You spend your week around those in the world, and sometimes that can be very discouraging. But the worship service is a time to be with those of like precious faith. But you know, not only is worship important to us, it's also important to God. And it's a subject that He has given a lot of emphasis to in the Bible. The word worship in one of its forms occurs 191 times in the Bible, 113 times in the Old Testament, and 78 times in the New Testament. If God mentioned it once, it would certainly be important. But with nearly 200 occurrences, we should be very interested in the study of this topic. What we want to do in this particular lesson is first to talk about worship with some specific things related to worship, and then we want to spend the rest of our time discussing the reasons why we need to attend worship. Now first, what is worship? Webster's Dictionary defines worship this way, to adore or to pay divine honors to a deity. Now, the Greek word for worship is proskuneo. Literally, this word means to kiss toward. It means to do obeisance, to prostrate oneself, to pay homage, to show deep respect. Now, the Bible describes four different types of worship. First is ignorant worship. Acts chapter 17 and verse 23 mentions this. In that particular chapter, Paul was in Athens on Mars Hill, and apparently that was a spot where people would gather to discuss interesting ideas. Verse 21 says, For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but to tell or to hear some new thing. Now, verse 22 says, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, now the King James says, whom you ignorantly worship. Paul said, Him I proclaim to you. Now verse 30 says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. But the point is that the Bible describes a type of worship that it identifies as ignorant worship. Now, could we be guilty of ignorant worship today? Sure we could. Any time that people engage in an act that they call worship, that they believe is worship, but that God has not defined as worship, it's ignorant worship. Now, a second type of worship identified in the Bible is vain worship. In Matthew 15 and verse 9, Jesus said about the scribes and Pharisees, In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now the word vain indicates empty, worthless, meaningless. They had corrupted the worship of God by adding their own commandments. And these people, Jesus said, were worshiping with their lips, but not with their hearts. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And according to verse 7, they were hypocrites. Now, is it possible for us today to engage in vain worship? Yes, of course it is. When I worship God with my lips, but not with my heart, it is vain worship, and it doesn't go any higher than the ceiling. Now, do you think that our worship is vain when we sing songs like, All to Jesus I Surrender, and then I don't give as I have prospered? Or how about this? We sing, Oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer. This is my constant longing and prayer. And then I don't come back on Sunday night. 
Is that vain worship? Of course it is. Now, a third type of worship identified in the Bible is will worship, Colossians 2.23. Now, will worship is self-devised or self-chosen worship. We might say that Cain was an example of this type of worship. He offered to God what suited him and not what God requested. And this might be the most popular type of worship today because society is big into the entertainment factor. Now, the last type of worship that we want to mention is, of course, true worship. John 4.23 says that God seeks true worshipers to worship Him. Now, there are three aspects to true worship. There is the proper object, the proper focus, and the proper acts. Now, first, the object of our worship must be correct for us to have true worship. And, of course, the object of acceptable worship is God. John 4.23 says God is seeking true worshipers to worship Him. Now, secondly, the focus of our worship must also be correct. John 4.24 says that our worship must be in spirit. Now, that means that your heart, your mind, your spirit is focused on worshiping God. You are focusing on worship. You know, sometimes we sing songs and sometimes we amen prayers, but our mind has been everywhere except worship. Maybe mentally you've been thinking about the meal you're going to have after services. Or mentally you've been thinking about that sporting event that you're going to watch when you get home. You've not been focused on worship, and your heart has not been in it. Now thirdly, true worship requires the proper acts. John says that we must worship God in spirit and truth. In truth means that we're going to do it the way the Bible specifies, the way the New Testament states. And if it's not in the New Testament, I can't engage in it and call it worship. God has specified five acts, five avenues of worship. They are prayer, preaching, the Lord's Supper, offering, and singing. And anything other than these five acts is not true worship. You know, sometimes people talk about the worship service, and they think that everything that takes place from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock is worship. But that's not the case. Only those five acts constitute worship. Announcements are not worship. In fact, a lot of things that might take place during that time period are not worship. And we're not free to pick and choose what is worship and what is not. I don't get to decide what to offer to God as worship. God has prescribed five things, and that's all. Now, there's a new idea that's popular with some people, and it suggests that everything that we do in life is worship. And some Christians have bought into this thinking, and the reason that I think that some people like it is the idea that everything that we do is worship allows people to do anything and call it worship. Years ago, I attended a congregation where during the Sunday morning worship assembly, some ladies would be in the kitchen preparing the afternoon fellowship meal, and when someone questioned whether this was a right activity, he was told, there are a lot of other ways to worship God than to sit in the assembly. But you know, that's not true. Now, there are a lot of other ways to serve God, but not all service is worship. Now, all worship is service, but not all service is worship. And the idea that everything in life is worship is simply not true. You know, when you wash dishes, that's not worship. And if you're washing dishes, even at the church, that's not worship. When you take a shower or you watch television, that's not worship. There are five acts that constitute worship in the eyes of God. And anything else that we might call worship at its best is vain or empty or will worship. All right, let's shift gears a little bit now and talk about why we need to attend worship. Now, we want to notice five reasons. Number one, reason number one, I need to attend worship because as a Christian, I'm seeking first the kingdom of God, or at least I should be. Matthew 6, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You see, now that I'm a child of God, I have a new set of priorities. I have a new set of values in my life. Christ and His church are the most important things in the world to me. You know, maybe before I became a Christian, maybe golf was a high priority for me. And maybe I spent my Sundays on the golf course because I really love the game of golf. Or maybe it was football. 
Maybe I loved watching football. But you know, whatever it was, it's different now because now I want to go to heaven more than anything else. And so I'm going to be at worship. Why? Because I'm seeking first the kingdom of God. Now, reason number two, I need to be at worship because I need to be with people of like precious faith. You know, there's a very interesting passage in 1 Peter chapter 4. In verse 3 of that chapter, Peter talks about Christians and some of the things that they engaged in prior to becoming Christians. And he mentions lewdness and lust and drunkenness and drinking parties. And, and then in verse 4, he says this, In regard to these, they, your old friends, think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation. Now listen, speaking evil of you. He says that after you become a Christian and you don't engage in these same activities with your old friends, they don't understand. They think it's strange and they speak evil of you. Now, that's not going to be good for your Christianity. In fact, a constant diet of that type of thing will tear you down. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. And as a Christian, I need to be with other Christians. You know, God made Christianity as a group religion. And being with other Christians refreshes us, and it strengthens us, and it enables us to go back out and to face the world. Christians who are in the military have oftentimes said that when they've been forced to miss worship services for long periods of time, they will talk about how much they miss it and how much they need it. We need to be with people of like precious faith. Number three, I need to be at worship because God commanded it. Now, I hate to say it that way because we ought to want to be there. We ought to be like David in Psalm 122 and verse 1 where he said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You know, when you study the pattern of the New Testament, what you see is that the early Christians assembled together regularly. Acts 20 and verse 7 tells us that on the first day of the week, Christians came together to partake of the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, it tells us that they were expected to give of their earnings when they came together on the first day of every week. And so, it was a regular weekly gathering of Christians. And if that's not direct enough for you, then listen to Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. It says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, the English Standard Version says, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. The Hebrew writer said that some in the first century had the habit of not being there when the saints met. And God said, don't do that. Don't forsake the meeting. Don't forsake the assembling of the saints. There's an old country song by Don Williams, and he says, I don't believe that heaven waits for only those who congregate. But you know what? He's wrong about that because God's people do congregate and God commands it to be that way. Now, just a word of clarification. A person isn't forsaking the assembly when he's too sick to come. A person isn't forsaking the assembly when he's in the military and he can't get there because he's been deployed and it's not possible to make it to worship services. A person isn't forsaking the assembly if he's a shut-in and cannot be present. Forsaking is something that a person chooses to do. Now, sometimes people will let one sniffle cause them to stay home, and they claim to be sick, and maybe they do that frequently. That is forsaking the assembly. Really, it gets down to a matter of the heart. Do I want to be there and I can't, or have I simply chosen not to attend? Now, a fourth reason that I need to be at worship is because of what I miss when I'm not there. For one, I miss the opportunity to worship God. Christian friends, that is one of the greatest opportunities afforded me. I have the opportunity to worship the Creator of the universe. And when I choose not to do that, I miss out on that opportunity, and really I show contempt for the Lord. Now somebody says, what do you mean by that? That sounds very strong. Let me illustrate this. Let's suppose that you make a lunch date with a friend, and you say to him, let's meet at 11 a.m. on Tuesday at my house for lunch. And let's say that Tuesday comes, and he doesn't show up. 
Well, let's say that you see him later and you ask him, why weren't you there? Why didn't you meet me at my house? What would you think if he said, well, I didn't have any particular reason. I just chose to do something else. Or what if you ask him to be the best man at your wedding and again, he didn't show up. And later you see him and, and you say, why weren't you there? And he says, well, Saturday's my only day off. It's the only time I can sleep in and relax. Or what about this? What if you had three appointments to meet together every week and he didn't show up two out of three of those times? What would you think his opinion of you was? You know, sometimes people will say, do I really have to come to all of the assemblies of the church? I mean, Sunday night and Wednesday night. Well, let's ask it this way. Let's suppose a man asked this question. Do I really have to go home to my family every night? Where is the law that says I have to do that? And you know the answer is, there's no law that specifically says that. But a man who chooses not to go home to his children and to his wife, just because he chooses not to, he shows contempt for his family and for his role as a father. And a person who chooses not to attend faithfully the services of the church is saying, I really don't love the Lord very much. I had a preacher say to me one time, he said, I just don't think that Sunday night and Wednesday night attendance is really that important. I could hardly believe what I was hearing. Friends, the fact of the matter is, when a person chooses not to attend when he could, he is simply showing signs of a deeper problem. You see, that person doesn't love the Lord with all of his heart and mind and strength and soul. And that's the greatest commandment in the law. And he's really not seeking first the kingdom of God. Now next, in addition to missing the opportunity to worship, when a person forsakes the assembly, he is also missing the opportunity to commune with the Lord. You know, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are in a very real and direct way communing with the Lord. In Matthew 26, 29, Jesus said, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And 1 Corinthians 10 refers to partaking of the elements of the Lord's Supper as a communion with the body and the blood of Christ. Now thirdly, when a person chooses not to come to worship, he misses much needed teaching and growth. Hosea 4 and 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. 2 Peter 3.18 commands us, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I heard someone put it this way. Suppose that every time the church assembles for preaching or for Bible class, you learn only one fact. A person who attends Sunday Bible class, AM worship, PM worship, and Wednesday night services would learn four facts per week. A person who attends Sunday morning services only would learn one fact a week. Over 10 years, the man who attends all of the services has learned 2,080 facts. The man who attends Sunday morning only has learned 520 facts. Now, which one of those people do you think is going to be more spiritually mature? Which one of those people would you rather be at the Day of Judgment? Okay, next point, number five. A fifth reason why we need to be at the worship services is for the sake of our brethren. Now, we cited Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25 a minute ago as a command of God that we must not forsake the assembly. But I want you to pay special attention to the way the passage begins. It says in verse 24, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. You see, worship is a time when we encourage one another. When we sing, we teach and admonish and encourage. And you know the funny thing about this is, you really don't even have to do anything. You encourage others around you just by being there. You know, when new converts are faithful, it encourages older Christians and makes them feel as if they're being successful in the work of the Lord. When teens are faithful in attendance, it encourages older folks about the future of the church. When middle-aged people are faithful, it's strengthening to see these people who put God before their careers and continue to be faithful. When aged Christians are faithful in attendance, it encourages everybody. It makes them think if they can be here in spite of the physical challenges they face, then I can too. If they can be faithful for 50 years or 70 years, then I can too. 
And when you come to services and the parking lot is full, it's truly uplifting. It leaves you feeling energized spiritually. But you know, there's another side of this too. Just as with your presence you encourage, by your absence you discourage. When we choose not to be here, and I don't mean that it's something beyond your control which you really regret, I mean you make a choice not to be here, you are discouraging people. I've been to services where hardly anyone was there, and you know the effect that it had on me? It really brought me down. Sometimes it makes you feel like Elijah in 1 Kings 19 when he said, I, even I, only am left. And he was greatly discouraged. We encourage by our presence and we discourage by our absence. All right, point number six. We need to attend worship if we want our children to go to heaven. Parents, consider all the things that we've already discussed and then apply them to your children. Our children need to be taught to seek first the kingdom of God. Our children need to be with those of like precious faith. That is, they need to be with Christians. They need to learn to worship God. They need the teaching and the growth and the encouragement. And I want to suggest this to you. Every time that you choose not to bring your children to worship, whether it be for a ball game or because the family was in town or because they had extra homework that night, whatever it may be, every time that you make that choice, you are teaching your children that there is something more important than God. You are teaching them that sometimes it's all right for God to take second place. And it may be that they go and win that championship game, but you see, they've lost something far more important. And the day is coming when they're going to have to make choices on their own. And the chances are they're going to choose what you taught them was important. Now, on the other hand, when you miss the championship ball game for worship services, you've taught your children a life lesson, and you've taught them that nothing comes before serving God. And then one day when they have to make that tough choice on their own, they'll remember. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. Now, I want to get really specific here for just a minute, and I want to ask, what about the Wednesday night issue? You know, some people will argue that assembling any time other than Sunday morning is not commanded and is without biblical authority. I heard a preacher on one occasion say that he could produce the scripture that teaches that we have to come back on Sunday night. Now, of course, I was very anxious to hear it. He said it's this, Matthew 22, 37. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. I like that. Now, what about the Wednesday night issue? Well, of course, the same scripture could apply, but I want us to look at another. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey those who have rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Now, this passage tells us that we are to obey them that have the rule over us. And specifically, it's talking about elders. We are to obey them and to submit ourselves because they watch out for our souls and they have to give an account. Now, even though Wednesday night assembly may not be specifically commanded in the New Testament, we still must submit to the authority of elders. And if they see fit to have Wednesday night assembly for the good of the church, I have to be there. In fact, it is mandatory because if I buck the authority of the elders, then I am bucking the authority of God. Now somebody says, well, what if the elders determine that we only need to meet on Sundays? Then there's nothing wrong with that because that's the only day that the Lord has mandated. Now in Luke 14, Jesus told a parable about a man who made a great feast for his friends. But when the feast day came, the friends began to make excuses about why they couldn't come. One said, I bought a piece of land and I need to go and see it. Please have me excused. Another one said, well, I bought five yoke of oxen and I really need to go and test them and please have me excused. The other man, he's kind of abrupt about it and he says, I've married a wife, please have me excused. But the Bible says that the householder replaced those guests with others. He sent his servants out to bring in other people from the highways and the byways, but the people who made excuse, 
were not allowed to eat the supper. Brethren, God is not in the business of collecting excuses with reference to His direct commands. You want to live a Christian life? Then be faithful in your attendance.